Good okay. morning. Everyone. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, uh, okay. No problem. Please Thank you. Ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm reading from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, verses 28 to 38. But as soon as, as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in, the, in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion you delivered them time after time. You warned them in, in order to turn them back to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances of which you said, the person who obeys them will live by them. Stubbornly, they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked and refused to listen. For many years, you were patient with them. By your spirit, you warned them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. So you gave them into the hands of neighboring peoples. But in your mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now, therefore, O oh God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps this covenant of love, do not let this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come on us, on our kings and leaders, on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You acted faithfully while we acted wickedly, or kings, or leaders, or priests, and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or statutes you warned them to keep. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them, in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so that they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing. And our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. The word of the Lord. And thanks be to God uh, for his red word. Uh, let us pray. Uh, Father, thank you for these words once again. And we know, Lord, that we can learn a lot from these words of Nehemiah. Uh, the people are broken before you. They are confessing their sins. And this morning, we want to come broken before you, Lord, in the sense that we know that whatever we do, um, we always, as human beings, mess things up. And like Israel and Nehemiah, we confess our sins and we turn to you. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you will speak to us and send your Holy Spirit to come upon us to empower us uh, to move uh, from our blindness into light, uh, to move from our deaf ears into hearing um, uh, years to move from stubborn hearts into humble hearts before you. So our prayer this morning is speak, Lord, for your servants here. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Israel is the people of God in the Old Testament. If we were to read the story of Israel from Abraham to the return of the exile, a span of 1,200 years, we will find out that Israel has not been faithful to God. There are many times in which a God allowed Israel's enemies to conquer them because of their unfaithfulness before God. Uh, 
Here in Nehemiah 9, the people are aware of their unfaithfulness to God. In fact, they are crying and weeping before God. Ezra, the teacher of God's law, has shared with them their history. The Levites, who are the priests, have explained God's word to them. As a result, they wear sackcloth and put dust on their foreheads. For many years, you were patient with them. By your spirit, you warned them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention, so you gave them into the hands of the neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Nehemiah 9, 30-31. The enemies conquered and scattered them, in fact, the two main characters of the book of Nehemiah come from the main cities of their conquerors. Uh, Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king in Susa, the capital of Persia, and Ezra comes from Babylon. Many times God has sent his spirit to them and warned them, return to me, return to me. However, they paid no attention. Their ancestors decided to adopt the gods and idols of the Canaanites rather than listen to God's spirit. When the people of Israel entered the promised land after 40 years in the desert, they conquered the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. Most of these tribes do not exist during Nehemiah's time as they were conquered and killed. By comparison, Israel survives even while in exile. The people of Israel pour their hearts out before God in their confession. They are slaves again, but not in Egypt. They are slaves of Persia. But see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so that they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. Nehemiah 9, 36 to 37. Twice in this prayer of confession, Nehemiah mentions that God sends his spirit to instruct them. However, they refuse to listen to God's spirit or the prophets through whom the spirit speaks. This time it is different. The Holy Spirit brings to them a sense of conviction and confession. They now confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors before God. The Holy Spirit is the personal presence of God in our lives. As we read the Bible, it is the Holy Spirit who touches our hearts with God's word. The Holy Spirit convicts Israel of their sins. There is now a sense of national confession and repentance before God. May I share with you the story of Richard? Uh, it is the Holy Spirit who brings Richard to a sense of confession before God. Richard shares his story in a devotional booklet. We know we are supposed to confess our sins and seek forgiveness, but imagine uh, finding not a forgiving God, but a judge who is about to sentence us to life in prison. What would that change in terms of our outlook on confession? The answer to this question is, it doesn't have to. Having accepted Christ into my life six days after my arrest, I stood before the judge knowing that I could not both stand for Christ and lie on the witness stand. So I confessed and according to the penalty prescribed by law was given a life sentence. Confessing was one of the most difficult things I have ever done but ironically, it was also the most rewarding. God took the small faith I had when I told the truth in court and began a work that has sustained me for over 20 years in one of the world's toughest prisons. I do not think that this would have been possible had I refused to confess my sin and live for God. By confessing our sins before God and people, we also confess our total reliance upon God's grace and mercy. The measure of mercy we receive depends on our willingness to ad admit our shortcomings. Our reward is a closer, more intimate relationship with the one who someday will judge the world. We are no different from Richard. We are not facing a criminal charge, yet the same Holy Spirit who works in Richard's heart works in our hearts. Uh, may we listen to the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit not only brings conviction upon us, the Holy Spirit also brings God's 
comfort upon us. So in turning our hearts to God, uh, God pours his Holy Spirit upon us and his Holy Spirit is uh, 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 communicates to us the comforting presence of God in our lives. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the statutes you want them to keep. Nehemiah 9, 33 to 34. They do not run away from their former wrongdoings. They now acknowledge that neither they nor their ancestors have followed God's law. They have ignored God. Yet, although they have been unfaithful, God remains faithful to them. God might have allowed their enemies to conquer them, but God hangs on to them even while they are in exile. As a result, Israel remains as Israel even though they are in exile. They are grateful to God for constantly being by their side and keeping them together as Israel. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Nehemiah 9 verse 31. We have been persevering through this pandemic to pray, constant hand sanitizing, physical distancing, and mask wearing. And we are grateful to God in his mercy for keeping us safe. In your great mercy, Lord, you have kept us safe. You have not abandoned us. You are a gracious and merciful God. Having confessed their sins and appealing to God's grace and mercy, they now ask God to save them from their hardship. They appeal to God not to forget them. Now, therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do, let, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come on us, on our kings and leaders, on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. Nehemiah 9 verse 32. When Israel prays this prayer, they hope that God will restore a Jewish king like King David who will overthrow the Persian Empire. God does hear their prayers and answers them in God's own way, not theirs. They pray that they be liberated from the Persian Empire. God, in his miraculous manner, has already used the Persian Empire for God's purposes. It is the Persian king himself who has decreed that the people of Israel return to Jerusalem from all over the empire. It is the Persian king who has sent Nehemiah and Ezra back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and remind the people of God's law. Who moved the Persian king to do all these things? It is their God, the great God, the mighty God and the awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with them and with us. It is this God, the merciful and gracious God, who hangs on to us while we go through this pandemic or while we meet the challenges, the other challenges of life. A physical king like Israel, uh, like King David, a physical king of Israel like King David will never be restored to Israel. Instead, for the next 500 years, the Persian Empire will be replaced by different empires, first by the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great and then by the Roman Empire. By the time of Jesus, it is Rome who rules over Israel. King Herod is the Edomite king who rules over Jerusalem at the birth of Jesus by the permission of Rome. God does hear their prayers but answers them in God's way. The Jerusalem temple and wall still stands. Israel keeps their faith in God. In fact, there are various movements like the Pharisees who begin studying God's law in the tradition of Ezra, the teacher of God's law. Uh, God might not establish a physical king, Jewish king like King David, but God makes sure that Israel progresses spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit. God does hear their prayers, but answers in God's own way not theirs. 
yet in a strange way, God does hear Israel's prayer for a king. About 450 years later, a king is born in a manger, in a stable in Bethlehem, the city of David. Magi come from the east to worship this baby king and to bring him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This king does rule over his people, but he does not rule by a sword. This king rules by teaching, preaching, praying, and healing people. People do come to him, but not to a traditional king. This king demonstrates his kingship not by military conquest. Instead, this king dies on the cross. Uh, the story becomes even stranger. God raises this king from the dead. God brings this king back to the heavenly throne. This king now rules as the king of kings from that throne. God does answer our prayers, but not always in the way we want God to answer our prayers. God answers our prayers God's way. Matt Lucado, the pastor and author, shares this conversation with his six-year-old daughter. When my oldest daughter was about six years old, she and I were having a discussion about my work. It seems she wasn't too happy about my chosen profession. She wanted me to leave the ministry. I like you as a preacher, she explained. I just really wish you sold snow cones. An honest request from a pure heart. It makes sense to her that the happiest people in the world were the people who drove the snow cone trucks. You play music, you sell goodies, you make kids happy. What more could you want? Come to think of it, she may have had a point. I could get a loan by a truck and ha. Huh, I'd eat too much. I heard her request, but didn't heed it. Why? Because I knew better. I know that when I'm called to do what I do, uh, I know what I'm called to do and what I need to do. The fact is, um, I knew more about life than she did. Same with God. God hears our requests, uh, but his answer is not always what we'd like it to be. Why? Because knows more about life than we do. God hears our requests, but his answer is not always what we'd like it to be. Why? Because God knows more about life than we do. Shall we end in prayer? Uh, Father, we just like to thank you that you do hear our prayers. And forgive us for the times when we've demanded that you hear our prayers in our own way. You do hear our prayers, but in your own way, in God's own way. And Lord, we also want to ask that you will remind us that you might not always give us what we ask in our prayers, but you always give us yourself. You will help us through life, through thick and thin. And so, dear Father, as we uh, go on uh, through this pandemic and face other challenges of life, we pray that you be with us and help us um, as we go through the struggles of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, as we uh, usually do, um, we will now...